two things have been on my mind this week. The first one is niching down. But more importantly, how inevitable it is. Inevitable! Is if you want to grow your business. I found myself in the shower a couple of days ago, just pondering. It's very rare that I get an undisturbed shower because I've got little kids. And I found myself um, just recollecting my thoughts and recollecting my thoughts. I'm always curious how one can not do something and still grow. You know what I mean? Like in every endeavor, eventually specialization comes into comes into question because not everyone can do everything at the highest level all the time. It's just not possible. And whenever it happens, sorry, not probable. I mean, I've been tossing up with that that difference, right? It's like it's not possible versus it's not probable. It's like is it really not possible? Have some done it before? Yes, so therefore if there are exceptions, it's a probability thing. And then if it's possible but not probable, then it's a, qu a case of are you the person to be that exception or do you then accept that you may not be the exception in which case that it's just not possible for you. Um, I think of LeBron James, you know, someone who, for those who don't know basketball, essentially people always talk about Michael Jordan being the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. He athletic, he could dunk, he could score. But people used to say that he couldn't rebound because he was still 6'6". You know, he wasn't, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, 7 feet, whatever. And then you get LeBron James who is bigger than, bigger than Jordan. You get into the nitty gritty of it all, we go on a tangent. But the point being is, there's once, there's all this once in a generation, you hear that phrase, once in a generation, somebody comes along who seems to just do everything well. And we try and get there, but we oftentimes don't acknowledge that it's not us. You know, as role model -y as that once in a generation person may be, as, ins as inspirational as they can be, and as much as they show us that it's possible, we have to acknowledge it's not us. Just on, just on basic, just eye test alone, right? For example, if I want to be that basketball player, I need to be a certain size. Am I? No. Disqualified. I... I want, if I want to be um, that basketball player, I need to I need to be in a particular location. United States of America, right? Not there, disqualified. The ch every, every factor increases or decreases the chances of me actually being there. And for the most part, when you look at LeBron James, he's got the God made him this way factor, which most of us don't have from birth, right? We're disqualified from birth. So therefore, for us to do something great, we have to specialize, we have to stand out for being great at one thing instead of being good at a whole bunch of different things. And I think that theme carries on into reselling as with any other area of our lives. Which is which is why like I thought why not talk about examples in everyday life that show us niching is so inevitable. I don't like fighting it. And I think for the most part the, the inertia comes from not wanting to do what we are told because that's why we became our own bosses. We wanted to, you know, do things on our terms, my way, my way or the highway, right? Because we had we had my way or the highway bosses that made us feel like our inputs were not valuable. However, when we eventually become our own bosses, we still have to grapple with the fact that maybe we're not that great. <laughs> maybe we do need to take some advice from wisdom of old, if not, if not from particular bosses that we don't like or respect. So instead of so this isn't about respecting the opinion of someone else. This is about respecting wisdom, respecting you know observations of history. That unless you're unless from birth you were qualified to be the exception, you're not going to be. In which case, then how do we make the most of this quote unquote shitty situation that we're in? <laughs> um, the when I think about hustle, um, working hard like really toiling and becoming great at something through a lot of hard work and repetition I think about Chinese restaurants I think about the lot when you go to a Chinese restaurant that is that is recently opened for the most part you get this two-sided menu but it's the, the font is so small and it's cramped into really really narrow columns because they're trying to be a general Chinese restaurant they they cook everything they cook you know any variety of any every variety of beef, chicken, pork, fish, you know, seafood, 
some random internal organ and if you want it spicy sweet sour you know it's salty they've, they've got it right it's it's any variation you can think of they'll make it and it's amazing until you go to the kitchen and you watch the chef cook and you realize that guy's a machine like he, like the i've done i've done i've done fried rice for a food fair once and just that one dish alone for three hours of cooking i was done i, I could not feel my hands the next day and this guy is doing it breakfast sometimes lunch dinner sometimes like through to the to the night rush you add takeaway on top of that it's just constantly right and and when you talk to people who work at chinese restaurants they will tell you i know how many dishes i need to cook in a certain time frame in order for the restaurant to be profitable there's a direct link with the speed and the efficiency of cooking essentially the machine must keep moving <laughs> directly correlated to the bottom line of the restaurant okay most of us when we start out doing reselling we know that that's going to happen like we know that there's going to be a lot of work involved to get to a certain point of profit to some extent it's quite exciting because when we when especially if you're transitioning from a job the if you're transitioning from a place where you were made to do work you didn't enjoy so you were worked overworked in the wrong places and you did and you crave the ability to choose the work you do you're like i'm happy to overwork as long as i get to choose the work that i overwork in the second class second group of people is the people who were not allowed to do the work even if they could all you i've got an idea i could make this better just let me give this a go and i reckon we'll, we'll see an improvement and your boss is like nope i don't trust your vision and you're just like and it's that 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 hustle that chinese restaurant machine working kind of imagery in reselling appeals to you because you now get to add all that value and see all the results okay inevitably though when you start reselling and you become full-time after about a year or two you get to the chinese restaurant's point of plateau which is no matter how much the machine works i know it i know how it i acutely know how it relates to my bottom line and i cannot grow anymore so what then does the restaurant do specialize or hire another cook those are your only two options you see how inevitable this is you get to a point where you have to hire a second cook to literally do the same thing that the first cook can do and then there's a, it's, it's a math thing really it's multiplied by number of cook profit multiplies accordingly with the with some adjustment for you know you've already got rest, you've already got rent on the restaurant whatever so you know you've got you've got efficiencies right but the point is it's a multiplication of the machine or the machine starts to do things with specialty and the specialty increases the price of the item i You've, if you've been to Asian countries and you've seen the food stalls that only sell one thing, it could be, you know, one variety of roti. Not every roti, one roti. It could be one soup noodle. Not every soup noodle, just one soup noodle with one meat, one veg. It's literally the same thing over and over and over again on rinse, rinse and repeat. But because they are so good at it, the line, they actually sell more plates of that one thing at a higher price point than the lower price point per dish over across across a bunch of different dishes and the line and there, there was never a line it was just the restaurant that we go to it's convenient we'll go to whenever the moment they specialize and they become the place for that noodle in that area the line is the line is non-stop because there's a sense of like fomo i if i don't line up i'm not going to get it and if i don't line up i may not get it because they're going to run out of stock right they can play they can play that whole game of if you don't come you're not going to get it because they are the specialty and I think that's the thing with niching down. You get to a point where the allure of the hustle and the grind runs out and you have to do something different. Otherwise, you start to lose the joy of doing it. Not everybody wants to work a farmer's day forever to the day they die. Most of us, when we do it, we're trying to do it as a step stone to a much more flexible, freeing retirement or younger retirement. And so, to enjoy that the business does need to change once the appeal of the grind runs out and that's why i think when you look at the when you look at niching down it's unavoidable you have to figure it out you have to give it a go you have to consider it early on so that you don't get to that point where you have no capacity for creativity and most of us once we're grinding we don't have capacity to think about it the the best lesson i ever got starting out as a business person 
Um, you know, you know those moments when you sit down with a friend who you know he's been doing business for a while, and in this case is my friend Josh, who at my age, but he'd been doing business for longer than I did. And he, I said to him like, just give me one thing to work on, and he just went. You have to work in and on your business. You can't just do one or the other. You do one or the other, you're not gonna get. You're not gonna get anywhere. You work in your business. Your business will not grow. You'll make money, but you will, you will not grow how much money you make. If you work on your business, but never in your business, your business doesn't make any money because you're just planning and making moves all the time, but not really actually transacting. And the funny thing is, when you spend so much time in one place, you struggle to get into the other place. If you don't, if for example, if you're the type that love spending their time working on your business you, you're building flat you're doing flyers you're, you're you're doing networking you're you know you're working on the website you're tweaking things you're revising things you're changing your setup you're spending on all these gear haven't you noticed that there's a huge inertia to then go and make the money and use the stuff that you've done you know you can you can be a great networker but you still need to go get the sales you know you still have to go and build up the books that let the networks start to make money from can get all the gear you still have to get the reps in taking those photos some people don't like any of that working on the business stuff, so they work in the business all the time but then when they are so tired and ground down when you tell them hey go work on your business have some time to think about doing this doing that making a change it's very hard they're like oh no nah, nah, look I'll, I'll get i'll get to it when i get a moment but they'll never get a moment they've never they've never made a moment for it ever why would now be any different so niching down, thinking about it, how can you specialize, how can you be the best at one thing, two things in your business rather than keep everything good across the board. That requires capacity, brain space, and you can only do that if you haven't gone to that, if you're, if you're not constantly needing the machine to work. That's all I'm saying. Or you can do what I do and don't sleep. <laughs> I mean, YouTube was very much an on the business move. Meeting you guys, networking with you guys, uh, building a community, having a place where I can talk through my thoughts. Um, and if they add value to you guys, that feedback helps me to realize, okay, this is good, this is not good. This is, I should or shouldn't do this and that. But at the same time, I'm doing that at 9.30 at night till two in the morning and sacrificing sleep as a result. Not gonna keep it up forever, but the point being is, if you don't, if you if you grind and grind and grind, and you're also the kind of person who needs your sleep, otherwise your body breaks down faster than others, you have to you have to factor that in, right? And so, in summary, you have to embrace the niche, whether you like it or not. There is an exception, and the exception goes like this, and it's probably a. a, a, a change a different perspective if you're not going to niche down on product because that seems to be where most people go um, where if you tell them the niche I go no 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 but I like selling jeans and I like selling books and I like selling DVDs and I like selling toys and I have an eye for the mall it's just such a waste to throw all that intel away true then you need to niche down on process what does that mean John very simply put if you look at that same Chinese restaurant example you have the chef that is cooking every single dish and they could be that iron chef type, master chef type chef that cooks every dish amazing, right? People, the restaurant's booked out for a whole year. What they then do is they streamline every other aspect of the business. There is, if you come and work in that kitchen, there is one guy who only prepares the veg. There's one guy who only prepares the meat. Their jobs don't overlap. You have one guy who only washes the dishes, you know? But because there's so much work for the one guy, your hiring process comes down to finding people who only do one thing. I mean, there are granted there are pitfalls in that model as well because when one person drops, you know, you need a replacement, you can't find a replacement, the other guy can't do the other person's job who's not there. But the point being is to keep the machine going and to keep the margins increasing, the products don't change, but the processes are super, super streamlined. So in my business, there are two, there are two of those things that are happening. The first one, I've already told you guys, it's product. It's true, it's the it's the it's the toys. Because it's toys in toy shops, shops specifically for toy cars, toy trains, action figures, dolls. It's stream, it's niche there already for the buyer. The other thing is all my items ship the same way. They all fit in flat rate packaging. If they don't fit in flat rate packaging, I generally avoid them. Um, it's very rare that I pick something up that I have to custom box for. 
and we're talking, you know, if there's a dollhouse that goes for say 300 bucks and I pick it up for $10, I will go through the, the effort of packing it up in a custom box. But for the most part, it's vehicles and action figures and dolls that all fit in flat rate, small, medium, and large boxes. So the packing is stream, which means that if someone comes to pack, they're all packing everything the same way. They're all stored in the same tubs. You know, there is no, there is no special tub for one thing versus another thing. So in, in that sense, it's a stream, it's a niching of process and it's a niching of product. And because those things that come together, I can still operate at the level I'm at with me and just one helper part-time. That's all I'm saying. You have to figure out how, at what point does it go from widespread to narrow down. That's all it is. Keep thinking about how you can narrow down. And here's the thing, right? You'll find insight that suits your business that doesn't suit anybody else because if you don't want to take the lazy route of, of narrowing down, which is dropping products and, and doubling down on only one category, you'll find creative ways to make it work for your collection of categories. And that, that, that actually makes you more competitive because when you think about other businesses that want to copy you, they can't because your, you started out selling a bunch of things no one else actually did. And to try and fulfill all these things together, especially if they're from different categories and you found a way that others haven't, there's a good chance that other sellers are probably not going to figure out either because it's, it requires more creativity than just dropping a bunch of categories. So that's what I want to talk about. The, inevitably, the inevitability of a niche. The inevitability of the narrow. The inevitable narrowing. Ooh. The inevitable narrowing. Oh, that sounds nice. This is a tinkle. Cool. So yeah, that was that's the first thought that's been on my head. In my head. The second thought. I'm nine minutes away from my pickup. So I'm not gonna cover the second thought just yet. Because the second thought, I haven't quite haven't quite haven't quite uh, <laughs> haven't quite worked out how I'm gonna tackle this one because it's it, it's it's there it's been niggling at me but I haven't quite what's the word I don't know where it's gonna go I know like I know what it is but I don't know where it's uh, ah! This is a challenge that a lot of YouTubers face, right? We, we, we want that to be uh, we want that to be an end before we start talking about something. But sometimes you just have to talk about something without there being an end. And this is one of those things. I, I never thought I'd find a topic that would be like this, but this is it. Uh, and it, it was... Mm. Maybe that's why some channels you don't get stuff, because they just don't want to talk about certain things due to the fact that there is no predetermined end. And, um, and this is not a live stream either. I, if, it, if it was a live stream, you know, you guys would probably tell me, yep, the topic, you guys would give me the, all right, we've, we've milked this topic, let's move on to the next thing. But because this is not a live stream and there needs to be some sort of ending, unless I go, there is no ending, then there is no ending. So, um, hmm. We'll talk about it once I finish my makeup. <laughs> talk about it when the pickup once I get the pickup go back into the car and um, we will address this one beautiful day to be out and about I don't really want to go back to the house and work in the garage but tomorrow is gate day so I'm gonna finish up everything I can do, tidy up and whatnot. And um, yeah, take Jenny out for a day. Spend some time in the markets, wander around. She loves going to the markets. Get a, get a bite, do some do some sourcing while we're there. Um, yeah, it should be fun. It should be a lot of fun actually. The thing I love about going on drives with Jenny is because that we, we're in the car, we get to talk about a lot of different things. Especially the things that you can't talk about when you were kids. It's amazing. When you set up to go for a drive, you the kids are not there. You don't have to be mindful of what you say. Um, you can be... Not even about the things you say, the way you say it. You know, if you want to be angry, you can be angry. If you want to be frustrated, you can be frustrated. If you want to be, you know, excited, you can be. You, if you want to be happy about something, celebrate something, you can. Um, celebrating things in front of the kids as well. 
is like you want to celebrate in front of the kids selectively because they're just curious right whenever they they sense that there's this overwhelming joy they want like, oh why what and then you have to spend time explaining it to them so this is not even relevant to them so figuring out the things that you celebrate in front of the kids so that they the their curiosity is satisfied for the things that are relevant to them not just anything um, yeah so i'm looking forward to just having the day in the car just talking about everything that's about us and the, the, the future we're building the family we, we want to have the plans for the kids any adjustments we need to make finances we talk about that a lot too when we go on drives um, where I'm going with the business um, how I'm using my time you know, with the business and YouTube yeah talk about any of our friends that we can support any of the fam any of our family that we can support talk about you know, anything anything coming up in the future that's exciting any potential opportunities could be with her job could be with my business could be with any of our friends wanting to do things together holidays you know it's a nice kind of time to keep what's it called take stock I was gonna say keep score that's not it take stock takes taking stock of what's happening with us and in our in our life and I encourage you guys to go on those drives as well. I mean, especially when fight if you're if you're in a relationship where busyness takes away from the, the ability to actually talk, go on a drive. The longer the drive, I mean, there's nothing else to do in the car other than talk. So use that as the as the means to get it done. Another idea is to. You want to go go for a meal further away instead of going to the place that's convenient and close by and just by going to the place that's further away driving you know 20 minutes there 20 minutes back you'd be surprised how much you can cover in a in a 40 minute you know return journey and the reality of being in business and married with kids is that things get overwhelming you know I, I didn't appreciate the drive until one drive we did, we both ended up crying in the car because we, just, we were just, there was just a lot going on and um, and the thing is, it's like a lot going on at the same time and I, and I appreciated just how safe being in a car felt because you sit in the car, you get to where you need to go, you're still in the car, you're still in the car, you don't have to get down yet, you just work through the emotions, talk through it and then eventually when you're done you come together give each other a hug and then you go enjoy that meal together and it's like the, the meal is like different it's, it's meaningful um, as opposed to you know going and and when you've got kids you don't want to do that in front of the kids because they don't understand not that you're trying to hide it they just don't understand um, and kids are the best when you whenever someone breaks down in front of the kids they, they, the kids they just want to come and hug you and make it all better somehow and um the next thing is you if you go on a, if you try and make a day too busy to like try and do too much in the day right you know with the let's say you've got um you go for a, a walk then you go shopping then you go eat somewhere and you, if you pack too much in the day and it ends up just being a busy day of hanging out but if the busyness is the thing that you're trying to fix if it's the unspoken thing you know where the current dynamic is that we're too busy to hang out and today we've decided to hang out and we've just gone and been busy that busy day actually just triggers more of those feelings of frustration that you've been so busy that you couldn't hang out because then it's like why did we even hang out today it's just another busy day but we're doing something different but it still feels busy you know so car rides man I'm such a big fan of car rides just car rides alone because then you can slow down and just talk um, yeah I'm looking forward to that tomorrow so tonight um, there will be no live stream I hope you guys um, enjoy the one that Grumpy Granny is doing on her channel please don't make her stay up to, to 2 o'clock if she obviously cannot do it um, but I'm thankful that she is doing it and um, giving helping you guys to actually still come to a live stream so that you know if, especially I know that a lot of you guys schedule it and look forward to it as part of your um, like weekly routine yeah, thanks Granny for stepping in and taking over tonight's one and I'll be back next week.
with our live streams. Right, almost at my pickup. I'll see you guys shortly. Um, Merry Christmas, I guess. Yes, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, second topic. So, pickup was done. Pickup done. Pickup done. Oh, this is this is a really good pickup. This one, this person put up a lot of Hot Wheels. I messaged them, picked them up immediately. I came. They said that they were clearing out their dad's estate, and so they had more. And let's just say by more, we've picked up. I think it was like 300 cars the first time and then it was another 500 after that and then today we're picking up another 500 and that's it that's a lot and so pretty happy pretty happy with how this has turned out um yeah just just being nice and asking people for their number and and saying hey if, you, if there's any more let me know in her case the prices have gone up gradually and I've noticed it because it worked out. It worked out to be like about a dollar a car at the start, and it became like you know two bucks. And I think she realized that they, that they had value, but because they had been stuff that was sitting in, in a shed for so long, um, and they all kept in pretty good condition too. And the average sale price of each car has been about that nine to fifteen dollar mark. And there are a couple of fifty dollar cars in there as well. Um, just to grow the store, I've been quite happy with that. Just having that variety too. And you guys already know, for me, it's the order ESP, not the actual item ESP. So therefore, if, you go, if you're thinking about like, you know, John, you're making five dollars a profit, is it worth it? Yes, when you're selling, you know, five, 10 cars at a go. So, and to grow a store anyways, you sometimes take, you, you do take lower margins because you need the volume. You want to be, for, well, for me anyways, I want to be that, that go-to. And so, as a result, I've seen every store I've built that I've done this way, I've seen the repeat buyers come because of the rate at which it happens. Um, buyers know when they see you know one or two items get listed every other day it's like whatever but if every day you're listing 10 20 items they're all of interest they're all listed the same way with great photos competitive pricing and when they ask what combined shipping it's done it's packed it's sent well you've essentially they, they, you get that loyalty very quickly and that's kind of why when I see these deals I just buy them up obviously if I'm just gonna break even I'm not gonna do it I still need to make profit but I'm not going for you know, buy at a dollar, sell at 20 profit from the start. And I know some people do that when they when they first get into reselling because you don't want to lose money. You don't want to not grow. But I think that's it. If you know how you're going to get there and you have a vision for how the store works and you have a model. And I've done this model across several, several toy categories already. So it's not new to me. Like I know it's going to happen. But of course, if you don't know why it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, and there's no understanding of the buyer that buys your stuff, then yes, I understand the need to go pay a dollar, get 20, just in case it you you, you don't get anywhere. Um, but yeah, that's not the situation here. So please don't copy this model unless you understand your buyer and the market you're selling in and the way that they buy. Um, so yes, the next thought. Next thought is, I was at JB Hi-Fi the other day and I was looking for Marvel Legends figurines because they've started selling them but they were hanging on the side of a shelf next to a bunch of CDs and I picked up a CD not that I was intending to buy a CD heck, I don't even know where I would play a CD at this point I don't have a CD player in my car or in Jen's car or in my house in fact, when my, when my son borrowed a DVD from school the other day he was like, Daddy, I want to play it and I went, yeah, go to your grandparents' house because we don't have one I don't know why I picked up a CD, but I did and when I picked up that CD, this thought occurred to me I don't, the last time I bought a CD, which was a while ago, as is, as is the case with most of you, you didn't, when you buy CDs, you didn't know what you were going to get. Think about it. You knew, like you knew the hit song, you knew the band, but you didn't really know because there was no way for you to sample all the tracks or, you know, you would wait for the radio to play the most popular one and then you would wait for, um, you know, maybe someone had a CD, someone had a CD that like, they, they would let you listen to, but for the most part, you liked the band, you supported them, you found the CD, and then you played it, and then 
maybe for the you were trying to figure out if there was a favorite there that wasn't the main song and for some of you you know you will see when some of you talk about the band you'll be like oh i remember that that album like i really like i know not people like that song but i really like that song you you kind of latched onto that special song that people may not have liked right and then that's how you got the oh you know you're just supporting the band because you know you, you you've heard that song already but you're not really a fan like the real fans like this other song that you only really could have heard if you bought the cd the point being is we now live in a time where you don't have that anymore you know what you're getting you can you can preview and stream and you know you can pretty much form an understanding of the thing you're buying before you buy and so when i think about reselling today there is no surprise that's how i think that's how i think i'm gonna put it there is no surprise as to what you're gonna get when you buy and for when the buyer buys an item i feel like because the surprise covered a lot of sins, right? The surprise, like you could, the surprise of what you would get, that unexpected value, forgave a lot of the sins of the seller. The seller could have been rude. The seller could have packed it wrongly. The seller could have, you know, cracked the case when they shipped it out. But when you got the CD, you open it up, you put it in there, you were, you were annoyed, but you were not that annoyed. Like, you were not unforgiving annoyed. You know what I mean? You were annoyed because you wanted it to come in a particular condition. But you were not so annoyed because once you put the CD in, you got additional value. I feel like today, there is no additional value in items anymore because you have this thing called the internet that tells you what you're going to get. If you want to preview how a toy works, you can Google it. You can use, There are people who review... People review the randomest things on YouTube, right? You can always find whether poorly poorly recorded or expertly recorded a review of most products and for that reason i feel like when you sell on ebay you have to deliver exceptionally you have to pack exceptionally because there is nothing once the buyer buys the item they already know what they're gonna get they already know in their head how they're going to use it or enjoy it unless there's some surprise use case that they have not discovered for the most part they already know what they're getting in which case, if the item arrives damaged, that's the additional value that they did not bargain for. You know what I mean? Like if an item, so I feel like back, and, I, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but when I thought about buying toys, buying like buying toys, buying books, buying CDs, any electronics, back in the day when you bought a when you bought a blender, you did not know how that blender was going to perform. There was the ad, there were maybe some infomercials that showed you how it would run, but for the most part. If you bought an item that only had a you know 10 20 second ad on tv and the radio you did not know so hence when you bought it and used it all that experience was additional value today you go on youtube you review that same blender you know how it sounds like because someone has bought a bunch of road mics to put next to them you've you can someone has got like a macro camera to kind of show you all the the things spinning around and, and all the bubbles forming you, you know it you've already experienced it without actually using it so when it comes damaged that additional unbargained for value ruins you because that's the last thing that they experience and of course customer service on top of that can help to fix it yada, yada. you you it, it, it then explains why in today's environment for you to be forgiven you almost have to give the item away for free because that's like the surprise they did not expect and i think and that's what i mean there needs to be more 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 and that's also why like you know when you think about the best concerts right people already know the artist can sing people already know the artist can this the artist can that but when you add to it the way they sang live really connected to me when you add to it the way that they did this and that and then this and that and then, and then no, i don't know where i came out of this other place the surprise element seals the deal and i think that's and so when thinking about how you sell on ebay excellence is almost like a excellence is a not negotiable good enough is not acceptable because you leave if, unless you don't want a repeat buyer or unless you want to unless you're the kind of person that you know, that you know is a race to the bottom type seller in which case price then price is everything most of us are not there most of you guys who watch this channel are not price to the bottom people you are people trying to get as high a dollar as you can for an item and hopefully also lead and hopefully have some sort of a following that allows you to get that high price with a high sell high sell through 
right? You want to go against the price, the price down. And for that to happen, you have to be excellent in your delivery because there are no more surprises with your products. I think that's where my that's where this train of thought ends. Yes, again, yeah, like like when I picked up that CD, I had forgotten why I enjoyed getting CDs in the first place. And it was that surprise. It was that whole, I know there are 12 tracks here. I know what two of them sound like and the other 10 are a complete mystery. I may fall in love with the band more or less depending on what these 10 tracks do. Despite the fact that I already love the band, I may, I'm still wondering whether this album makes or breaks the experience of the band. And today, that no longer happens because you can sample everything one way or another through the internet. And that's why you have to be excellent in your delivery and you cannot stuff up. You cannot, do not surprise your buyers because they don't want any surprises. I think that's it. The, they get it, they know what they want, they get the deal, they want the instant gratification. First surprise, item arrives earlier than expected. Ding! Second surprise, item arrives with a coupon code included. Ding! Third surprise, item, item arrives with an unexpected free gift. Ding! Item arrives packaged even better than expected compared to other sellers in the past. Ding! Those are the kind of things, those are the equivalent of, here are the 10 tracks that I've never heard of, um, and I wonder what they'll sound like. Do those things. That's it. That was the second thought. So these are the two thoughts. The inevitable, the inevitable narrowing and the gift of the surprise. Just don't give, don't just don't give bad surprises. Go! Cool. Until the next video. Happy reselling and thanks for watching this rendition of Long Drive. Long Dive. Enjoy Grady's live stream. Bye!